Oh, and welcome everyone to the uh, Big Speak uh, Leading Your Workforce During This Time of Uncertainty Virtual Workshop. Uh, we welcome you from wherever you are around the world that you guys are. Good morning, good afternoon, or maybe even good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. We have put together an incredible panel today to discuss the, the most relevant topic of this time. Our moderator and host, Dr. J.P. Palu Fry, is from the Institute of Health and Human Potential. And not only is J.P. a New York Times bestselling author, but of the book Performing Under Pressure, where he helps individuals lead and innovate under pressure in the most extreme situations. He is also a performance coach to the NHL and NBA teams, along with Olympic medal winning athletes and corporations like many of you who are on this call today. Joining JP on the panel is Wayma Hoover, former Global Head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Google, and an executive coach and culture curator. Wayma has served as the architect and driver of transformational change, leveraging diversity, equity, and inclusion to activate employee engagement, build diverse talent pipeline, pipelines, and harness cultural competence to connect and internet access with customers. And finally, rounding out our panel is Robert Richman, co-creator of Zappos Insights, corporate culture architect, and customer experience expert. As one of the world's authorities on employee culture, Robert is a sought-after keynote speaker at conferences around the world and has been hired to teach culture in person at companies such as Google, Toyota, and Eli Lilly. Now, before I pass it over to the panel, I'd like to let you guys know that we will be monitoring the questions in the chat. I've seen some activity in there already, um, and we'll be answering them during the presentation. So please ask your questions. We want to make this as interactive as possible. And with that, I am going to pass it over to JP. Hey, Jennifer, great uh, intro. Thank you very much. Wayma, Robert, great to have you today. I have to tell everyone, uh, kind of tell everyone at home, um, when we were doing all of our pre-calls in preparation, I loved our conversations. I thought if we can even touch part of that conversation on here, I think people will get a lot out of it. So thank you to everyone at Big Speak and uh, looking forward to spending this hour with you, Wayma and Robert. For, for a format um, for everyone um, who's with us today, you know, we're gonna start the three of us talking, but listen, we wanna hear your voice as well. We've got a chat function. If you've got a question or a comment, throw it up there. We'll do our best to include. We've got a few poll questions. We also want to thank everyone for answering the survey. And, and you know, this might be actually an interesting jump off point. Um, we know from the data that 40% of folks are kind of actively looking for jobs. From our survey, and it's a smaller survey, no question, it was 60% that people are like kind of looking at jobs and maybe not looking to change, but looking at other jobs. Does that surprise you, Wayma, Rich, uh, Robert? Love to, love to hear it. Let's start there. And Wayma, why don't you start off? You know, uh, JP, it does not surprise me. I yeah. think in the environment where now we're seeing a return to work and people have become accustomed to working, not only remotely, but finally have been, got a rhythm, got a formal practice of dividing work from life and also start benefiting from that balance. And now I think it's incumbent upon the organizations to think about what does that look, the new norm look like? We yeah. can't go back to what was, you know, the historical practice of just FaceTime presence, you know, you being rewarded by having, um, being there longest at the hour, at longest hours at the office, but what does that new norm are gonna be look like? And how are you gonna allow employees to really structure that and really provide their feedback on their integration back into office in holistic and very um, thoughtful ways. Yeah, it's like the genie's been let out of the bottle. All of a sudden people are like, whoa, you mean I can have this kind of, and you've said it before, you don't like the word balance, but this integration where it's not, it doesn't take a pound of meat off of us, you know, to go to work. What do you think, Robert? Yeah, I, I, I like what Wayne was saying about 
not being able to go back, it's like it's not backwards compatible, like a software operating system, right? People have gotten used to being at home. People have gotten used to working less hours. Um, and once you get a taste of that, it's you, you just can't go back, especially with the kind of options that people have more um, in, in terms of checks coming from the government, potentially other offers. But I think also one of the what might even be an elephant in the room is what I would call a bit of existential dread. Mm. You know, there's so much going on of this almost end of the world feeling that people start thinking like, wait a minute, what am I doing with my life? Am I really enjoying this job? Am I enjoying the people I'm working with? And they're yeah. rethinking everything. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. Uh, I think it's Kathy, uh, Kathy Roth was saying at Woodward, her organization, we use the phrase work life harmonization. I like that. That's a, that's a great way to think about it. So let's broaden it out a little bit. Let's think about the pandemic and migration to you know, remote work. How has that affected? And let's think of kind of three parts, you know, work itself, organizations and people. Waymo, you know, what are you seeing? And we started to talk about, but let's get into this a little bit as well. I think from an organizational standpoint, what some of the advantages are, I'll say about the advantages and opportunities, is that there's a recognition and an understanding that employees and companies are more agile and resilient than we ever thought. Hmm. There was this belief in, in terms of historical management practices that there had to be a very rote nine to five, you know, nine, 10 hour work day that you, you know, could not, if you could not see what you did not need to deliver, yes. that was not being done. And you had to completely suspend all of those very, very antiquated management practices. And people were able to be productive remotely. People were still had the work ethic. You know, productivity was not lame. And so I think that that's one of the advantages um, that came from this. I also think that um, one of the risks though to that is that there is a lack of the disengagement and, 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 and non-connectivity because of the focused work and because people are networking within their circles they had already. And so how do you expand that in a virtual environment now being intentional, but not having the structure or having the practice to do so? So those are some of the things that I think you know, our advantages, but also high opportunities that actually were created during this very dynamic uh, time that we were in. Yeah. What do you think, Robert? What would you add to that? Yeah. So I, I come from a media and, and film background. And the way I think about this, this change. By is... the way, Robert, I think you've got the best voice ever. You've got a radio. My mom would say you've got a, no, I can't say it. My mom would say, <laughs> I used to do radio on at, at college and she used to joke, Son, you've got a radio face, as you know, as a really bad joke. And I was going to use that joke on you, but I thought that's really poor of me. You got a great radio voice, Robert. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for excluding the face part. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, with 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 thinking about this as as media and a media shift, because those are always big shifts in technology. The way I think about it is this: it's like going from the theatrical to the cinematic. Hmm. And and the idea with this is think about this in terms of theatrical versus cinematic. It used to be theatrical in person, meaning like imagine that you were going to meet an, ex an executive at their office. You'd go into the big building and you'd meet with the, with the first receptionist and then you'd go up the elevator, second receptionist, sit in the couch, go into a big office, all these awards on the wall, big, huge office. So these power dynamics are there within the theatrical space. And now that's changed over to we're all squares like Hollywood squares mm. on a screen. Mm. And it's that's a very big switch. And it's kind of like if an actor thinks, oh, I've done theater all my life, I can just do film. But yes, it is the same, but it's also very different. And how is it different? Well, in the theatrical, when we're in person, we can we can connect with all of our senses. We're there. It moves a little slower. Um, there's more focus to it. You know, it's very noticeable if you're on your phone in a meeting. It's not so noticeable here if somebody's <laughs> just looking at Facebook right now, right? Yeah. And so then, sorry, you go what over was that, Robert? I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you go over the to, to the cinematic and what's that change to well it goes a lot faster 
it's it's mm. quicker. Um, we have to hold attention a lot more. And and yeah. an, and another metaphor within that is essentially going from like a prop plane to a jet. In a prop plane, you've got time to adjust. It's slower. It's moving. In a jet, everything's moving quicker, and and it's 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 just more dangerous, right? So so mm. this is everything is really speeding up. Mm. And I think uh, anybody who's in a leadership position is communicating all the time in this way. And are you adjusting to the medium? Are you doing the things for radio voice? By the way, get a great great mic, uh, only like $100, uh, but really adjust in all these ways to the new medium. Yeah. And, and, and JP, ahead, I want one thing to build upon Robert, which I agreed 100%. I think what we're also seeing is that the remote and virtual environment is like the great equalizer, right? You no longer have those individuals with the dominant personalities, very extroverted, that have all of the kind of um, uh, pomp and circumstance when they get in the meeting, because now, Everyone, to your point, is cinematic, Robert, right? And on the squares. And so it has, in a way, become the great equalizer yes. in that you have to be thoughtful. How do you engage? How do you make sure you have full contribution, full insights from everyone um, that's on the team or engaged in meeting? Totally well, agree. I've got a question about that. Um, I, I think this is a very interesting kind of bent. Do you see it having any? advantage, I don't even know if that's the word, for introverts versus extroverts at all? What's your sense of that? I, I do, right? I okay. think it's something that has to be really, when we get into management responsibilities and capabilities, that is one of the things that has to be really thought of and has to be managed. I do think from that perspective, and I say it's the equalizer, because now you need, you see everyone's, you know, face. I know right. in my environment, we wanted people to actually be on video so you can see their engagement. And quite frankly, you wanted to make sure that there was full uh, contributions, full participation. And so from the sheer, you know, kind of methodology of ensuring that you had um, a effective meeting and you had the engagement, everyone had a voice or was given an opportunity to engage. Whereby if you're in the office setting, you will always see those that just have the gravitas, if you will, to command and control. And yeah. that was lessened in the remote work environment. Yeah, yeah. You know, what's interesting. I think it's your earlier point, Wema, about we had this belief, oh, we can't do that, mainly because mm -hmm. we haven't done that. Now we were forced to do it and we realized, wow, there's a lot of things we can do more than we think. So I, I think that's an interesting one. I'll give you a personal example. About eight or nine years ago, the president of our organization suggested strongly and then pushed us, mainly me, because I think I was a bit of a stick in the mud on this, to, to go to a virtual office, to sell our building and to go to a virtual office. And we did. And it was hard at first. And I'm glad we did for so many reasons, especially through the pandemic. But, but it's hard. And I think it brings up and it connects to what you said, Robert, about speed. There is a speed of change. I mean, we've had speed of change every last five years and 10 years ago, but this is really at a different level, that jet propulsion level that you're talking about, Robert. And so I'm, I'm thinking there's probably two parts. There's probably many parts to talk about, but at least two. One is the mental health effects, which are very real, and, and isolation because we're in all the Hollywood squares. But then the other piece, you've got to run a business and you've got to make tough decisions and be agile and make those decisions. So it's that's hard for managers and leaders today, isn't it? To manage those two pieces, the mental health of you know, the folks who make it happen, but also, hey, we got to move fast to stay in business. Thoughts, Wayma, Robert, whoever. Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the another metaphor with this that came from the agile world is going from from marathons to sprints. So if you think with a marathon, what you're doing is you're 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 almost like unconscious. You're just trying to conserve energy, right? And that's kind of a, a that's that's basically a, a, a burnout technique. You're burning it out all the way to the end. Versus okay. sprinting, where you prepare, you get ready, you sprint for like a mile, and then you rest, and then you get ready. And 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 it's it's this kind of pattern of organizing that uh, that that really works. So if you think about it, like like again with an athlete, um, if an athlete has a big event. And then they're completely exhausted afterward. That's natural. That's great. You expect it, right? Like that's part of the process. But imagine they don't have that big event. Imagine it's just practice day and practice day and doing this. And you start to get burnt out 
yeah. um, in a bad way. So I think that there's getting burnt out in a good way where you're doing what you love, you're performing, and then you have a break versus just this marathon approach of, of where is this going? When's this ending? Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Wayma, thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and I want to highlight the mental health uh, challenges because I think that they're very real and very significant. I mean, when you think about, you know, to, Jay, to Robert's point, you know, being that the remote work, right, the advantage is that you're agile and resistant, re resilient, but then the disadvantage is that now the lines are blurred between home yes. and, and work. Right. People have, you know, the research has showed that in the last 18 months to two years, there has been extreme difficulty to know when does your work begin? Where does your life begin? And then how to manage that? Because the expectations of the organization has said, yes, we're resilient. Yes, we can do that. So therefore, meeting starts at 7 a.m. <laughs> therefore, yeah. we're taking global international calls at 9 p.m. And so you're looking at your face when you had that daily commute, whether it's in a car, whether it's on a train, whether it's in a bus, you had that kind of, you know, decompression time yes. built into your natural day, it's gone. And not only it's gone, it is hijacked now. And right. so that actually is causing the high burnout and the difficulty of employees, even with the best intent to keep the momentum and expectations. And, and on top of that, you have now blurred lines with child care, elder care, yeah. the schools were closed. How do I still maintain my commitment, my engagement, the level of productivity, and also make showing that I, I am a, a, a very engaged employee. At the same time, I have children that are not in school, <laughs> that I have yeah. to homeschool. So it's like, there's so many dynamics there that um, with advantages, but things that organization have to manage and really provide um, some resources to support. Yeah, and I, I mean, the data is pretty clear about how there has been this asymmetry of effect. Women, way more than men, yes. there's no question. Hispanics, we know, have, have been a group and, and minority racialized groups have absolutely had a bigger impact on you know, their employment to population, some of the ratios that economists would look at. And it's interesting to see how things are coming back in some groups, women are coming back, but other groups are not coming back as much. So, you know, I think the childcare one, I think, is a really important one. And, and it's interesting. We've got an international audience here. I'm in Canada. Two of you are in the U.S. Um, you know, it's interesting because I think we're starting to see some of the public policy and the support for things like national childcare, you know, really have an impact. Have you seen that, Wayma, as well? Oh, absolutely. More organizations as part of the pandemic and their shift in benefits um, to employees and really what our managers expected to do have started offering um, subsidies for childcare. Yeah. Started actually having and really demanding um, some work, hybrid work weeks, recognizing that the time frame, you know, if you're sharing childcare responsibilities with your partner or your spouse, and your your you know partner or spouse is working you know from eight to four, and you need to work from five to you know nine or ten. That flexibility and agility is now being expected for managers yeah. to support, as well as finding interim daycare, child yes. support in the communities that they work in. Yeah, that's that's a great point. You know what? I think this is a great point, a jump off point, Jennifer, to bring on our first poll. I want to know where everyone's working. So please. Jump on the poll, everyone, and answer this question. Where are you working today? Are you in the office? Are you at home? Are you on the road? Are you in San Diego with Robert on the beach? Those are the four options. Um, and, I'm, and we're not going to give you a lot of time. So go real quick because we don't want to break flow. Um, but please answer it as quick as you can. And then, uh, Jennifer, if you want to give it a few more seconds, then let's, uh, let's see where everyone's working today. Absolutely. It looks like 80% participated and we have 69% from home, 26 from the office, and the other four or 5% on the road or checked out at the beach. Huh. But, I mean, does that surprise you 26% at the office? I, for me, that surprises. I, I don't know that many people who are actually at the office or am I, are you guys less surprised? Maybe because I'm in Canada. I don't know. What, what do you think? I, I'm, I'm not surprised by anything these days. I think it's <laughs> okay. just all across the board. Yes. Um, what I hope to see personally 
is the hybrid model work in a way that's that w- is what I would call ritualized. The yes. same way that that it used to be a lot clearer where we'd have our work week in the weekend, right? It's like the weekend itself is a ritual. And so how can that be applied to, to corporate? Well, can it be quarterly meeting in person? Or is it one day a week we do meetings in the office? Even right. if it's once a year that you know you have that to look forward to. Right. Um, if those rituals and traditions are there, any sort of mix of it is going to be good because it creates kind of a sense of, of, of certainty and frameworks to work with. Yeah, Robert, I think that's great. Kathy Burton is saying that um, in their organization, they're running at about 20 to 30% in the office as a preference. So that's, thank you, Kathy, for sharing that. By the way, that ritual piece, Robert, I want to link to what Wayma talked about. Um, I think we're all a little bit more aware of a morning routine. That's something that I'm pretty big on in our work with athletes and individuals. But I don't think we're as dialed into what's the after work routine, which is maybe partly what you're saying, Robert, but Wayma, definitely you're mentioning that. What are the rituals we have to end the day? Because I think we don't have the drive home, the commute. So what are those things that we can do? And there's a number of things that I think is really important. And part of it is creating that ritual. So you're like, okay, I'm now leaving. And one of the things is just to literally go out, out of the house for a walk for 10 minutes. That's what some people do. But what are those things that I can kind of close up? You can still come back at eight or nine o'clock, which a lot of us do, but in that time between six and nine, let's say, to, to really try to tune out because, and I forget who put it in the, uh, in the chat, but you know, cortisol is, it's a beautiful thing to help us keep, you know, to survive, but it can really have an impact on burnout and our ability to enjoy. And, and let's just be clear for everyone listening, there are really three characteristics of burnout. Yes, tired and fatigued, but that second one, we get less joy from the same moments we used to get joy from, less pleasure. And the third one is we feel a bit jaded or cynical about our work. So, you know, check in for yourself. Those are three kind of criteria. And cortisol has a really big impact on that where we kind of are constantly pumping out cortisol. We never have that time, kind of like what you're saying, Robert, to just stop, you know, and as we call it with athletes, periodization, you know, have those really high intense moments, but then those really lower moments yeah to, to use the 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 metaphor of the flight again you've got you know essentially the the runway takeoff in flight heading down and landing right and i say to people okay what's the most important part and to me it's the landing because yeah. if you mess up a landing that's where a major issue comes in yeah. right so i think that it, there's there's so much talk about morning rituals yeah um but my belief is it actually starts the the evening before yeah. i actually discovered this talking to a friend i said i had the best day ever i did this i worked out i got all this done and he's stopping my story and goes hold on hold on what did you do the night before and i got oh my gosh i had it's such a different relaxing night before that started it and i also realized too that in the in the morning like i i, I actually characterize it as there, there, there there's morning robert and evening robert Right. And if evening Robert doesn't do those things and plan the next day, morning Robert's really confused and, and because <laughs> evening Robert thought Robert or morning Robert was going to be really clear and lucid. Um, and those end, those end of the day rituals, it's interesting about this, this idea of, uh, of end of the day, because there's a book on, on flow states by Stephen Kotler, Rise of Superman, who talks about the flow states being at first, you're, you're frustrated, then you get in a meditative state, then it's all flow, and then a relaxation period. But the interesting part that they miss in the book is that they talk about stunt people uh, being in a state of flow, but they get into an accident, not on the stunt, but on the way home. Because what happened is, yeah, they don't realize that they're out of the flow state. So Mm -hmm. there's this missing stage in there of actually landing the plane before it's on there. And so the like, I'll just give you one example, because since we're talking about cortisol, um, one example that, that I've learned now I'm doing is cold showers, or now I actually have a cold plunge, but you can use a cold shower because it rises norepinephrine and clears cortisol in a natural way. So yeah, I think those kind of landing the planes, those rituals, planning the next day, I would say are maybe even more important than the morning ritual. Yeah. If I can add to that, and and I would like to challenge our thinking and that uh, beyond just start of the day and the end of the day, I think we need to actually manage throughout the day, right? Mm-hmm. I think you need to control your calendar. I think you need to really, pri- it has to be prioritization. What is the most important critical thing and 
where can my time be used at the most highest value? Yeah. Working, you know, at Google, working um, at Santa Fe, I had international teams. And so I had for sheer my work, I had to be on international calls. So therefore, I may not have had the luxury to stop at a six or seven. But what I did was making through time throughout the day, moments of decompression, mo moments of reflection, moments of thought and processing. Yeah. And I think that in today's environment, as global as our world is operating, that's what we should, managers should be promoting. How are you kind of taking that time, having those moments of pause yeah. for reflection so that you can have restoration? And if you have those days where you must go from an eight to China to, you know, um, you know, the late evening, you know, for Latam or Europe, that, you know, you are, you have that restorations because you've been thoughtful about giving yourself that time to pause, break, and restore yourself. Yeah, yeah. By the way, when you describe that, and, and we do, our work is somewhat global, but not as global as that. I think, gosh, I feel like, wow, that's a lot, which brings us back to this 40% of folks are actively looking for a different job. Let's now think about what can organizations, what are some of the better organizations, better managers doing to engage and retain their folks. And, and you know that changing dynamic of employee needs and expectations. So, I mean, there's a lot here, but I've got to believe everyone who's listening in is worried about that because one thing that, that I, I just want to add this in that I think we sometimes forget is we have this real worry in the last five and seven years around uh, the demographic shift that was coming. And in fact, because of what happened in 08, 09 and 10, a lot of people stayed in organizations. We know that from you know, the economic data. Like it seems right now that it's almost like this double hit. People are realizing, hey, I can, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. I, I actually like my life like this. And a lot of folks are leaving the workforce probably permanently, at least that's what some of the data suggests. So it's really this, you know, multi kind of variable time and place where employees have more power than ever. But let me ask you, the two of you, from your expertise, what are the best organizations, what are the best managers doing to retain and engage their folks? Who yeah. would like to go first? <laughs> yeah, I can go. Um, so one, one of the best models for this I learned from, from Tony Shea, uh, rest in peace, former CEO of Zappos. And what he did was he was studying positive psychology out of Harvard and found that the four requirements for, for positive psychology and happiness uh, could be applied within the workplace. And so those, those four as a framework for keeping anybody just really engaged. Um, the first is perceived progress, is we want to feel like we're progressing. You know, if, 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 if you're on a boat and you see the horizon, you never get there, right? If you're, if you're, if you're constant, if you, you don't feel that progress, but if you take a step back and look as, as Dan Sullivan says, in strategic coach and actually see how far you've come and see your progress and growing that keeps people engaged as the first one. The, the second is perceived control. So we want to feel like we have control over that. So for example, at Zappos start the progress by making it rather than just there's an, an assistant buyer and a buyer, which would take years it goes from assistant buyer A, six months to B, six months to C, and then buyer A, B, C. So you feel like you're making progress every six months. But the control part comes in where you're told these are the things you can do to be considered. You're not guaranteed, but you got to read this book. You got to shadow with this person. You got to try this task, et cetera. So people actually feel like they're in control of their progress rather than favoritism, politics, and that kind sure. of stuff. Um, the third element here is, is strong relationships. It was found that when people feel like they have a best friend at work, they stay. When they have a great relationship with their manager, they stay. It could be a great company, but if you don't have that best friend, if you don't have a manager that you like, uh, you'll leave to go somewhere where you will have a better time um, relating. And the fourth in the positive psychology is higher purpose. And higher purpose, that's simply something bigger than you can do alone that you care about that's beyond money, that keeps everybody connected. And so if, if, the, if the processes, especially of employee engagement and progression is, is designed with those four in mind, um, then people tend to, tend to stay engaged even for their whole life if they feel like they're making that progress. Yeah, that's, let, let me say this and then Wayne, you jump in. What's interesting about that list and, and put it up again, Robert, for everyone to look at, how many of those have to do with the bigger organization and how many have to do with the direct manager? 
you know, when you look at it, we, we, we sometimes call it umbrella managers. In this big organization, you can have a couple of umbrella managers who protect their team from some of the chaos and panic and, you know, what's going on and, and create that place where they do feel a better, stronger, a more emotionally connected relationship. They feel they're more in control. They're making progress. That's a big one that I think a lot of people miss. And they're connecting everyone's work to, you know, this bigger, something bigger than themselves. I like the way you say that, Robert. So the good news in that list, and, and, I, and I think it's right on, is it doesn't have to be organization-wide all the time. You as a manager, if you're watching, listening right now, you can do things to create your unit, your team, increasing on those four, and all of a sudden people are feeling more engaged, are wanting to stay. They're not, you know, looking at ZipRecruiter or wherever. Wayma, jump in. Yeah, I, I you know, uh, echo everything uh, that you and Robert say, and I'll build upon that. I do agree that, you know, what is actually going to work is for employees to feel that they're a part of a unit that has a higher purpose. And so I'll say that one of the most critical things is inclusive leadership. Mm -hmm. Leading with empathy, leading with understanding, and leading with the need that the team supports each other. And so what do I mean by that? Is allowing, when and necessary, hybrid work, work time. If a team member needs support or have other family or life responsibilities, looking at it not as their problem, but how can the team afford for that? That's the things that I implemented in my previous roles, in my two roles that was very successful. When you give and empower managers to yeah. make the decisions, to help the team operate effectively. These are the things that come naturally. And these are the things that not only um, increase morale, increase commitment, yeah. increase the connectivity, but it actually builds trust. Yeah. It builds trust because you have leaders that have high emotional intelligence really weighing in on, yes, you are here, you are a worker, but yes, you are human. Yeah. Yes, you have purpose. Yes, you have a life. And that is what we as a team are going to support. And the research I've found, and there are several articles I'll share after, that in, that, in those situations, there is an exponential growth in the productivity and what the, those individuals who get that benefit and have that task, what they'll put in we, involuntarily without even being yeah. asked. So what do you, you, what the dividends that you get from doing that for being inclusive, having inclusive leadership, leading with empathy is, you know, trifold, right? And so that I think has to be kind of the core comment and consistent, um, the empowerment of the managers, the education of the manager, higher emotional intelligence, yeah. and the allowing for treating each person as an ind individual, because everyone is going to have different circumstances. Everyone will have need, different needs. And how can the leaders and managers be prepared and have that, that, that insight and that tools uh, to lead in this environment, but to really be able to have that strength, that purpose, and that connectivity within their, within their teams? Yeah. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, I, I think that it, talk, talking about this on a macro level, on a, on a micro level, there's an opportunity to essentially gamify things because we all there's there's a, a great book called reality is broken that studied gamers worldwide who are very engaged any parent knows you don't need to motivate your kid to play a video game right they're already engaged and what makes it so engaging and she found that it's four simple factors which is having a goal rules a way to keep score and that it's opt-in not not forced yes. so the way that the, the that this can be done for example i mean how many of us have gone to a a, a meeting where we're like what's the point of this how do we even know if we're done and you know as, as i was talking before about ways for introverts to, to to be equal uh amazon what they do is they start off with uh, a, a memo that everybody reads at at the same time, they have the same opportunity and time to read it. And then they look up. That's one of their game structures with it. But so with a goal, you, you, you pick out the goals and this can be done either virtually or like on a wall and having sticky notes, like a Kanban board of the different topics, you're discussing it. Once you're done, we're moving it over. And the goal is to get all these over there because everybody wants to win the game. And the other part of that is having essentially what I call a shot clock. I have this now even for speeches is, is, is everybody being aware of the time. Yeah. And if you're aware of both the time and the scoreboard, 
then everybody wants to win that game versus when you don't have these things, suddenly it's the end of the time and everybody's, oh, well, we got to schedule another meeting because we didn't get everything done, right? So that's just one little example of how things can be made into a game that we can play together. Yeah, by the way, I'm loving all of your props there, Robert. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. And, I, know, and, I, didn't get, I didn't get the memo. <laughs> I know, but, but I didn't see you move that one panel completion over. I guess we're not quite done yet. That'll be the next <laughs> but, but you know what's yeah, interesting? And, and, and do, do ahead, you can add to that because I want to do, I do also want to talk about what organizations and companies can do, right? Because there is something at a macro level that organizations need to do and respond to the new norm. One of the things that, um, I implemented at Google and at my previous company was, you know, the re a relocation model, like having there be multiple um, headquarters jobs, if you will, like expanding the footprint so that if it's the right talent, they can work from where they are. Right. And that actually being, you know, core common for are the roles that there so that you can have people who still feel that, as we talked about earlier, can be rooted in their environment, can still have, you know, the work-life integration, don't feel that they have to relocate, and that now the organization supports that. Now, what that entails is, you know, much more skills with the managers to have actually have hybrid work, people in the office and people working remotely, much more thoughtful leadership around the team engagements and the engagement and effectiveness. And also, how are you ensuring that that connectivity of those kind of um, team members that do not kind of work outside of the home office. But that is what we're seeing um, a lot. Google has implemented that. Um, Santa Fe, we had a global flexible work that was implemented. And you see more, a lot of companies because at the end of the day, we have gained this, you know, wonderful strength in working remotely and all the wonderful tools and uh, technologies that are out there. Why not continue to harness them? Yeah, yeah. What's interesting is I think in some ways the pandemic has more revealed poor managers as much as anything. Those who don't really have that connection, that emotional connection where there's high trust. Because what's clear in the last 18, 19 months is we've had to take risks. Yes. And when people feel afraid to take a risk, they're not going to take that risk. You know, some of the work we've done with the US Navy, I remember being in a program in Washington, I think it was. Um, and on the wall, there was a sign that said, um, ships are safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships are for. And I loved it at the time. And actually it's funny because as I thought about it, it's, it's really, can we as managers with, with all of our macro policies and our micro interactions, make people feel safe to take that risk, to get out of the harbor where yes, there's more risk, there's also more reward. And, and that's what's going to take to manage the change that we're facing. You know what I'd love to do, um, uh, Jennifer, if you want to uh, put up the next poll question, because I'd love to ask a question about kind of what people are doing, concrete steps that your organization, for people who are watching today, you know, what are you doing? Um, you know, what's your company doing in terms of taking concrete steps to address retention? So, you know, in the last six months, have you taken concrete steps? Yes, no, or maybe you've talked about it, but haven't really taken action yet. Love to hear people's uh perception and opinion of that. And let's see those, uh, those answers, Jennifer, and see. Okay, interesting. I mean, you know what the hard part is, and I hear this a lot, it, you know, at our organization, we survey 40,000 people a month. And so, you know, it's interesting, and both in programs and research, people, managers, leaders feel so busy, so overwhelmed that I think at times they can go, oh, what, how am I supposed to do that? I can't do that, right? And I think, are we getting to a time and place now where yeah, you're busy manager, leader, but you're going to lose a couple key people. And our organization has found this. We've been hiring folks in the last month or two. The amount of time that our senior folks have put in to hire people has just been like so much more. It's almost like we need to point out to managers and leaders, look, you lose someone to find someone and to hire them and to onboard them. Like that's exponentially more time and effort so it's almost like I, I, I sometimes think we're, we're so much in presentism, we don't realize the long-term effect of losing good people. 
Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, for engagement, what, what I mentioned with this model before is what we would do at Zappos is a quarterly survey with this, with questions like, do you feel like you're making progress in your career? Do you feel like you have control over that? Do you feel like you have a best friend at work? And the interesting thing about this is that the, the it also includes a space to mention anything. And one of my mm. favorite facts about Richard Branson is that they said he used to not only ritualize, but loved reading customer complaints. Mm. He said he loved it because they're handing me the innovation I need to do. I don't even need a research department to figure it out. They're telling me what to do. Same thing internally with that survey, they are saying what needs to, ha needs to happen. And so what, what would happen with the survey is one, it's transparent. Everybody would see the results of the survey. So yes. you could, by department, so you could see and say, wow, people don't like their lives in marketing right now. And that kind of public shame for a manager to see that and everybody knows it is stronger than any type of just admonishment off to the side because it's right. transparent. Right. And those right. questions within there um, would be answered by the right person. And those answers shared with everybody as well. And this done on a quarterly basis. Mm. So it's a, way, it's a way to take in these things, uh, uh, complaints, suggestions, all these things. And a lot of them that that people tend to uh, like brush off. So for example, I was working with a company once where, where they were complaining about the chairs. And they said, you know, uh, uh, we, we don't have the budget for this, et cetera. Until one day, challenged the CEO. I said, how often do you work at that front line? And I said, oh, I just worked an hour last month. And I said, no, your, your people don't work in, in, in hours. They work in days. Go work there for a day. Yeah. And, you know, by the fifth hour, he said, oh, my God, my butt hurts. Right. And then like, he said, OK, I'm getting the new chairs and actually paid attention to that complaint. Like Richard Branson uh, got the new chairs. Service scores went up. So I think just being that in touch with the yeah. engagement rituals and being transparent about it, taking action and answering will keep people there. Yeah, and Weymouth said something earlier that I think is it, it, we we almost have to underline and you know highlight, which is in order to get that feedback, first ask for it and then really be open to it. It requires a lot of emotional intelligence. You know, we've got to be secure in our role, secure in who we are to hear stuff that doesn't feel very good, doesn't sound very good, like because that's our life work or our month's work or our quarter's work. And I think Robert, it's a great point that that's where we're going to find those opportunities to really delight our customers if we can understand and be open. But it's not easy, is it? Especially if there's that lack of trust in the culture. Is that true, Wema, from your experience? Absolutely. And, 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 and I think when we talk about retention, we have to talk about why that is a problem because employees are disengaged. Employees do not feel that there is trust. There may be lack of, you know, um, integrity and in lack of the credibility to what you're saying and you're doing, especially during the times when you're not where we are, nobody was prepared for what was going to happen. And yep. so I would like to liken the retention to engagement and really, you really drive the solution in ways that can address is through empowerment. Like how do you empower your employees so they can feel like owners? Yep. So they can feel vested in the environment, the team, the results. Yep. And you do that for, by, creating feedback loops. I mean, much like Robert had said, you know, the pulse surveys that you do quarterly, that is great, but there also needs to be just in time, very thoughtful and actually open ways and channels for employees to give the feedback, not only to right. their leaders, but to the senior leaders. I actually would, you know, one of the, the strongest mechanisms is employee resource groups. You know, you can have employee resource groups, not, not, you know, obviously with all of the diverse communities, but you can have parent support employee resource groups. You can have remote work with employee resource mm -hmm. groups. You can have employees coming together and networks to talk about what are the conditions they're working on and we're working in and really come up with solutions and ideas to address that. And there should be the conditions and opportunities within organizations and companies to provide that feedback in a very concise and timely way. Yeah. Whether it be at town halls, giving it to the senior, you know, the, the CEO and his leadership team, making sure that there is that feedback and that opportunity for anyone at any level without retribution or, yes. you know, or being inhibited. But, but, but I think that that is where really the critical part is really to drive engagement through the empowerment of employees. Yeah, Robert. JP, I, I love you bringing bring the emotional part into it. It, it, it makes me think about this, uh, this feedback technique that creates 
a space for both truth and safety um, that, that Robert Cialdini came up with this, this question of ideally face-to-face, -face, not survey monkey, not by email, but just eye to eye, maybe asking for some other feedback, but using the specific wording of language of saying, would you please tell me the thing you think I don't want to hear? Mm. Would you please tell me the thing you think I don't want to hear? What that's doing is creating safety for somebody to give that thing that they weren't going to give and say, no, there's no way I can say this. But now you've got somebody saying, oh, please, I'm, I'm asking for this. Would you please? And creates that safety to deliver the truth. Yeah. You know, and that's really important. The higher you go up in an organization, as I, I'm sure the two of you know, this idea of CEO's disease. The higher you go in an organization, the less candid feedback you're going to receive. Sure. So you got to go out of your way, which is, I think your point, Robert, you got to really signal, look, I'm saying, I want this. I'm even saying, please here, because I want this. You know, Marion Boyle asks a great question. Um, and thank you, Marion, for the question, which is in this new remote work. And it really does seem from the research of large organizations that we're probably going to a hybrid work, you know, approach. I won't say forever, but for a long term, and maybe forever, we'll just say, you know, two days, three days in out of the office. What do we do from your perspectives to build in that accountability? Because I do understand from a manager's perspective, you know, you they're out of sight, out of mind. How do we build accountability? So I'd love to hear from both of you on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I, I, I think, and, and this is something kind of I have to bring in my own philosophical approach to that, uh, to this. I think you have to focus on performance. I think that there needs to be manager capability around how to manage performance. Because to me, the question is not either remote or office. It's question is around how are you as a manager able to assess the performance, the deliverables and objectives of your employees and of your team. If you do that successfully, you won't need to have the question of remote or office, but obviously you wanna have moments that the team can come together, that they can build morale, team spirit, team engagement. That is fantastic and you make moments that, but really how do you create a, a performance culture so that when there is employees coming back in a hybrid work environment, you know, thinking about having one team day, but that there is no fear that when they are off or they're working remotely, that work is not being done because everyone has clear accountability on what their objectives are, clear accountability on what results look like, and managers know how to lead and manage in that environment effectively. So for me, there, you know, it, it is not about remote or home, you know, yes. remote or work. It's really around performance. It's around smart objectives and it's around manager capabilities to really drive the assessment and the management and the team results of their organizations. So, so Wayma, I'm happy for you to take this, but Robert, you, you might have a good answer too. And I'm happy to add myself. I'm thinking like, that totally makes sense. What are some of the concrete things people can do? Any yeah. thoughts on that, Robert? Absolutely. Why don't you start, Wayma? You can go next on that. Absolutely. So I was talking to an executive who said was speaking about this about accountability, and said people weren't delivering on time. And I said, "Let tell me the exact words of the conversation because culture exists in language." And he had said, "Can you get me this in two weeks?" And the response was, "That should work." And I said, "That wasn't an actual." agreement. That wasn't an actual <laughs> commitment. And whenever somebody says that should work, that's not a commitment, right? And so the it, it's really kind of a structured invitation process to get accountability. So first, it's an invitation. And again, we talk about safety. Is there safety to say no, to have a conversation about it, to notice if somebody's like, uh, yeah, because then we can have a conversation and say, okay, well, what's getting in the way with that? Well, I need this thing first. Okay, well, assuming you get that, or I've got too many other things. Well, can we take a look at your priority list? Maybe we can take something off. Maybe we can get something to somebody else. But it can be a discussion that's leading to an actual commitment of somebody saying, yes, I, I will. And that's them being in alignment with themselves. And if, if you really want to turbocharge it and experiment with this, and they say that, you can ask this phrase after that. You can say, is that a promise? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, whoa, okay. So it's really about invitation, the, the discussion, agreement, confirmation. And when you have that kind of language structure, people are going to be in alignment with themselves because they said they do it rather than something like that should work. Yeah, Robert, great. Waymo, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think with accountability, there has to be two things at the at the heart of it. There has to be communication, and there has to, which is feedback, 
right? There has to be the feedback and there has to be the with them, what's in it for me. So in organizations and what I led in organizations and actually led ask the leaders to do is not only looking at clarifying what the roles, the, the specific objectives and making sure that there is feedback along the way. Yes, this is what I'm expecting. Yep. Yes, you are delivering. No, you're off track. <laughs> no, we need to really re reserve and you know, kind of kind of reshift and organize. And then making sure in those discussions, not only do you give feedback, but you offer opportunities to develop. Mm. This is not working. This is not shifting. This is a way, or maybe someone you can shadow, or a, a course you can take, or an online lear learning that you can take to help. I think that has to be the core because it has to be around managers again, capabilities taking ownership, yep. having, really seeing the value in their communication and their feedback, right? Mm -hmm. So that you're not looking at, you know, the first of the year in January, laying out these wonderfully often stated uh, performance objectives. And then at the end of the year saying, checking out, nope, nope, nope. But having the, the, the desire and really wanting to develop, give feedback, allow that performance not only to be done, but to be managed effectively. And at the same time, offering the coaching and development along the way so that there is more incentive and there is more you know, accountability for the employee to do that because they now feel like they have a supportive manager and they have the tools that are not only developing them in their objectives, but develop them personally. Yeah, well, gosh, there's a lot there on that one, isn't it? And I think, I think it's a pain point for people. Um, Here's a couple of things that, that we do in our organization, but certainly, you know, when we work with other organizations um, that I think is pretty important. And I think, Robert, you said this around language. Language really matters. I think it's important when you're in a conversation to say, are we in a discussion phase or are we in a decision phase? Because sometimes it gets a bit muddled. And that speaks to your promise piece. I like that, Robert. That's one. Another is if you're someone who has more power in the relationship and power dynamics are so important, we could talk for an hour about that, which we won't. But if you're in a higher power position, again, language we use is, you know, that's a soft or that's a strong opinion. Because a lot of times when someone's in a lower power position, when you voice an opinion, they just think, oh, that's what we're going to do. So if you're not, you know, for the person in the higher power position to say, hey, you know, this is a soft opinion. So it's just an opinion. It's not like this is what we're going to do. And, and, and so that's a second piece of language. I think that that really matters. The other piece that I, I want to highly recommend is one-on-ones, weekly one-on-ones. They, they don't need to be more than 30 minutes. And a great little way that we approach it is 10 minutes for the direct report to talk about anything on their list. Work could be personal, but anything on their list, the manager, 10 minutes, anything on their list and then 10 minutes to talk about anything else. And I think that's actually one of the most important pieces. And, and I don't consider myself a great manager, but I think that's a really important piece that keeps me connected to my direct reports. It keeps us having those conversations, that connection, because when we haven't done that in the past, it, we start to kind of get off on different directions. And then we're in a, high, a bit of more high pressure meeting. And, and we're really talking about two different things. We're having two different conversations, not knowing it. And then there's a lot of impact. And so I would say, do your best to have weekly, and I mean weekly, one-on-ones. They don't have to be more than half an hour, but that goes a long way to keeping that emotional connection and keeping all the other pieces, like you're talking about Wayma, the kind of the manager capabilities within that 30 minutes. That's when feedback can happen. That's when lots of other things can happen. When I hear somebody say, oh yeah, we're having our perform a yearly performance view and I'm going to give them feedback. I'm like, no, no, no. In a yearly performance of you, in my opinion, you never give new information. You just have more time to talk about what's going on because you want more in-time feedback. It's a big thing with athletes that we've found, right? Those athletes, they need to have feedback as close, not, not like right after, because sometimes, you know, there's, there's emotion. But once emotion, you know, cortisol has dissipated, that's what you want to give feedback with in that 24 hours because they, it's more salient in their mind. So listen, we are um, coming, we still have a few minutes, we're not done, but we're kind of coming more to the end. Um, again, I wanna ask folks to please ask questions. Zeta has an interesting question about managing up. Um, you know, she's had times when she's been very candid, but there's resistance. What do you do if people above you are resisting and not seeming to be open to ideas? Wema, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think in that in that situation, um, it really has to be with the individual to kind of map out what they want out of it. I would not say to give up, but also kind of look at what I actually coach and really promote is like, how do you have your board of directors, right? The people internally and externally that can actually give you a different perspective of the relationship dynamic that you may not have, right? right? right. Because you're in it. How can they provide um, maybe alternative suggestions um, to not only have you connect, but maybe there is opportunities for you uh, to actually connect with other managers or peers of your managers to help influence your relationship and actually set a better condition for you to perform. I think that you know all of us owns how we show up. Yeah. All of us owns how we manage or um, deal with and facilitate relationships. And if there's a resisting manager, they own that. And that's a part of them. But Absolutely. what you can do is continually really try and actually look at alternative maids. Your manager is mad, but it may not be your manager tomorrow, right? Yes. You may have opportunities to grow and have that maybe opportunity to actually have some other peers of your managers or other people in the organization to see your talents and see your skills. And then again, I always keep, and I recommend everyone to do to kind of have, you know, their own board of directors, both yes. internally, out turn and, you know, externally to continually give them honest, open and candid feedback on how the way that they can show up in their best selves. I think I'd like you to be on my personal board of directors. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, what do you think? Um, we've got a few more minutes left. Any thoughts on, on this one? And then we'll, we'll conclude. Yeah. So one is if, if, you're, if you're doing that management, I'll always ask him permission. You yeah. know, can I, uh, yeah. it, it reminds me of that military term, uh, permission to speak freely, sir, right? Like get, get that permission to, to actually do it. Um, but the other is, you know, managing up, it's such an interesting topic. It was, I, I really like it. It was definitely frowned upon at Zappos of a, of a service leadership model. You're there to serve your people, not the other way around. Um, but I think what a manager can do in that situation is, is kind of flip it. So like the example for me would be, I had to really realize like the hard way that I, I, um, if I'm in front of my computer, I'm not really hearing people. So I had to say, look, if you want to bring me up a new idea, if you're doing it while I'm at my computer, I'm like not even going to hear you. So just make sure that we have a, a room schedule. So think about those ways you want people to manage up and make them aware of your kind of idiosyncrasies and things of how you need help. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you, Robert. Honestly, the two of you, I mean, I expected we'd have interesting insights. I, I, I'm taking, literally taking notes here. So um, I appreciate all that I've learned, and I hope everyone there is, is able to get as much as I got out of it. Um, so, you know, keep an eye for email from us because uh, there's an opportunity to get more content and more value in the email. So if you want to go deeper, there's a number of ways that you can do that. Take a look. That'll be coming, uh, I think, today, actually, or tomorrow. I'm not sure. Um, and there will also be a recording of the webinar as well. But I'll say this, um, this is not an easy time. And if you're struggling at all with your team, in your job, as your organization is facing quite a bit of disruption, just know you're not alone. You know, there's a term in psychology called terminal uniqueness, where we terminally think we're the only one going through an experience and we're not. And just know you're not alone. And sometimes that can help because, I mean, exhale a little bit and go, okay, let's begin again. And so I, the personal board of directors at Wayma talks about, you know, having those, and, and Robert talks about the importance of strong relationships. Those two pieces, they are probably the most important antidote to stress and pressure. So make sure you invest in those, you know, so you can be rejuvenated. So I want to thank Wayma and Robert for spending this time. This whole project's been like so much fun. And big speak, of course, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Barrett and Ken and everyone else. Um, we will see everyone somewhere on the road soon. And uh, thanks everyone and, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, JP.